Welcome to She Said Homestead, the podcast that explores homesteading from a range of perspectives. We're Sage and Michaela, two homesteaders, each with unique experiences, properties, and future goals for our homesteads. We're discussing various homesteading topics, sharing our personal experiences as women working full-time who are managing homesteads as well, and shining a light on the stories of other inspiring homesteaders. Before we dive in, be sure to hit that subscribe button so you never miss an episode. And if you enjoy our podcast, please consider leaving a review. It really helps us grow and share these homesteading stories with even more people. Hey there, guys. Welcome back to the podcast. I'm Michaela from Calico Cow Acres. And I'm Sage from Terra Nova Acres, and we both have homesteads in Western North Carolina. Today, we are going to be talking about the best and worst homestead advice we've ever gotten. This is going to be a juicy one. (laughs) But first, why don't you tell me about your week, Sage? Yeah, this week has been all about the new animals. So I got the new lambs. There's two ram lambs that I got from a creamery in Georgia. And I also picked up a livestock guardian dog puppy from a farm in Virginia. She is a Great Pyrenees and she is going to be absolutely huge. We briefly talked about them in the last episode with Chrissy, but you didn't mention while we were recording what their names were. And I don't think we've talked about the the puppy whatsoever. So what are their names? Yes. So for the ram lambs, one of them is all East Frisian. And then the other one is half East Frisian, half St. Croix. The one that's all East Frisian, his name is Camembert, which is a cheese or cam for short. And then the Half East Frisian, half St. Croix. His short name is Rocky. (laughs) Clearly, I don't ever call them by their long names. (laughs) What is that cheese name? It's Rockford, right? With a Q. If that's the cheese name, then yeah. It's R-O-Q-U-E Fort. Mm -hmm. Rocky. That sounds right. I don't think I've ever had that cheese in my life, but um, yeah, that's his name. Okay. (laughs) Tangent. Uh, Do you spell it like R-O-C-K-Y or are you going to spell it like (laughs) R-O-Q-U-E? I don't think I'm ever going to have the occasion to write it down. So, you know, it's just, it's, it's whatever it is. (laughs) It's whatever you want it to be. Okay. In my head, because I picture like when you, when I say a word or like a name, I picture how it's spelled in my brain. And that's probably just a me thing because I'm weird, but it's going to be (laughs) R-O-Q-U-E. If you ever have to spell it. Yeah, he can, he can be Roque. He can be fancy. (laughs) Roque. I love it. And then what's your puppy's name? Her name is Athena. I wanted to give her a name that was, you know, kind of intense because she's going to be a livestock guardian dog. So the the goddess of war seemed appropriate. She's the goddess of nibbling on things right now. (laughs) My God. Yeah, a teething puppy. She's a little shark. And if she's in the house, yeah, it's game over. I'm so excited to meet them. You better hurry. They're getting big fast. <laughs> so she's going to be your livestock guardian dog with the sheep. But is she is she out there with them yet? Or is she, are you like still working on training her? I'm still working on getting the sheep used to her. So she's used to sheep. She came from a farm with sheep. So she is totally used to them. But my ewes that I got as lambs last year... They are not used to a livestock guardian dog. They know copper. They're comfortable with copper. They've seen a dog before and they're getting there, but it's just going to be a process and I don't want to leave her alone with them until I know that they're not going to get scared and accidentally hurt her. And also the chickens are up there and so I need to be up there to supervise to make sure that you know she's not going to chase any chickens and whether she means to or not hurt one of them so it's just it's a lot of supervised just exposure time for everybody right now is she used to chickens at all besides yours there were chickens on that farm as well but i don't think she interacted with closely with any of them but she did (laughs) interact closely with the sheep and that's the bigger deal to me because ultimately my chickens are behind electric netting most of the time anyway so it's not it's not a huge deal The, the sheep are the main priority really Mm-hmm. Oh, I'm so excited. She's going to be, she's literally going to be like another one of the sheep. She's going to be so big. <laughs> I can't wait to see how big she gets. White and fluffy and giant. Yeah, she is going to look like another one of the sheep. I like to think about you shearing the sheep 
and then how big she's gonna look compared to them <laughs> like once she grows full size so, i've had that that'll be too. Fun. <laughs> what about you what did you get up to this week so taylor's dad is coming to visit this weekend and we have just been in cleaning mode <laughs> Because our house is an absolute disaster. So, you know, guests are coming, so we need to clean up a little bit, contain the chaos. The main task of this week was getting our fruit trees planted, finally. Our first fruit trees. We got those $15 ones from Tractor Supply a few weeks ago. And they're finally in the ground. Hopefully they're going to grow. Fingers crossed. I'm worried. (laughs) Yeah, it'll go one way or the other, and you don't know until you can get some stuff in the ground. The reason we're so worried about it is because we get so much water in those streams down there. I'm worried they're going to just rot and they're on the berms and like obviously the swales fill up with the water but they're right next to each other and it's just it stays really wet down there so. I'm glad that we got the $15 ones to try out. I would much rather lose like $60 worth of trees than $200 worth of trees. Of the trees that I've gotten, because I've gotten both the $15 tractor supply ones and fancier bare root ones from various nurseries and things. And one of my healthiest apple trees was a tractor supply $15 one. On to today's topic at hand, which is the best and worst homesteading advice that we've gotten. We're going to start with the worst advice that we can end on the positive note. We can end on the best advice. And at the very end, we're going to be going over some best and worst advice that our listeners have received. For me, I'm going to start it off with people telling me that I should get goats or pigs or a cow or whatever animal they think I should get that I don't currently have. Now, objectively, it's not bad advice that someone should get goats or a cow or pigs or any other animal but for me it does not work i don't have goats because i don't like goat's milk i'm not interested in having them for meat they get out really easily and i don't want to deal with that i don't have pigs because i don't enjoy pork and so it's not worth it to me and i don't have a cow because i would so much rather just have sheep there and there are a million reasons that the animals that i do have work better for me and it's just non-stop that people tell you what other animals you should get. I think we get this comment more than any other comment that we should get goats. And I don't know how many videos we've mentioned in it that we are going to get goats. <laughs> and people are like, okay, but you should get some goats. <laughs> I'm like, guys, come on. <laughs> Please watch the video. At this point, it feels like I need to have a note on my screen typed out so I can copy and re- like reply to comments, like copy paste. These are all the reasons I don't have them yet, so I don't have to type it out every time. I was talking to our neighbors the other day, and I asked, I was like, at what point will people stop asking me to get goats? And she's like, it took like three years for us. And I was like, okay, we're like halfway there. (laughs) By then we should have goats. So it should work out. Goats and pigs and cows especially aren't going to work on any property, just any property, and they're not going to meet everybody's needs. You don't like goat's milk. The reason we need goats is because we need them to clear kudzu and poison ivy, and we have so much land to manage. The goats will work for what we want them for, and people want us to get pigs, too, to dig up the tubers. And it doesn't work for us because Taylor's vegetarian, and I can't butcher a pig by myself. Not everything's going to work for everybody. And then cows are just really big. Right. Cows are huge. And then, you know, I've talked about this a little bit before, but then all of your eggs are in one basket for your dairy animal. And if you lose your cow, you know, for, and especially for me, like I'm one person, I'm not going to have a backup dairy cow. (laughs) Two cows hanging around. Um, So if I lost that one cow, I'd be out of all my milk. But if I, and it would still be unfortunate, obviously, but if I lost a sheep, I wouldn't be out of my milk potential. I and mean, can you imagine having like multiple cows on your property, <laughs> like on your three acres? No. <laughs> That's a no. lot. <laughs> it is a lot. I mean, my pasture is only an acre, barely. My first worst advice is when people say to look for resources or mentors or people who are doing things the same way that one, either you're doing them already or the way that you're looking to do things to learn new skills. Inherently, trying to learn skills that you're you're wanting to learn isn't necessarily a bad thing, but I personally like to look for people who are doing things differently 
than the way that I'm thinking I'm going to do them because it makes me question my methods to see if I'm doing them, you know, in the best way that I possibly could be for myself. And it also makes you learn things like the whole point of this for me is to learn. I love to learn things. I always look for people who are doing things differently than the way that I'm doing them. Yeah, I think there's a lot of value to both sides, right? Like, for me, I there's so many things that I never would have learned in terms of no dig gardening or whatever if I hadn't if I hadn't sought out people who were doing it the way they were, that I wanted to do it. But then you also can end up in an echo chamber. You also can end up not doing things as efficiently as you could if you broadened your horizons and uh, were able to borrow elements from multiple different ways to customize it to what works for you. Yeah, I, I feel like for both of us, the last thing that we want to do is get complacent with how we're doing things. Like, I think we're both just kind of adventurous with the hobbies and things that we want to try and do. So it makes sense that we'd always be searching out new stuff. My next one is I had so many people and continue to have so many people tell me that I need to plant fruit trees immediately. And I did this and I regret it because I didn't know my property very well. I planted trees in some areas where they didn't survive. And if I had known my property better, I and I had known like where things drain, and I had seen what grows where to say, okay, this is growing here. That means there are these soil issues, or this isn't growing here. That means there's these soil issues. I could have saved myself a lot of money because those are trees that I still want to have, but now I have to replace them. And some of them were things like pecan trees that are older, and those are really expensive to replace. So. I understand why people say that, you know, fruit trees take a long time to start producing, but it's not better to do it as soon as you physically can, if that means sacrificing your understanding of what would be the best placement for them. How many fruit and nut trees have you planted on your property so far? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen. I can think of 13 right now, which probably means that there's at least 15. <laughs> <laughs> That's the ones that you have or the ones that you've killed or all of them? <laughs> In total. Oh, okay. I've replaced one that I killed, which is a pecan tree. There was a mulberry tree that I lost that I did not replace yet. I lost a persimmon tree because the sheep barreled it over, which was my fault. And I lost a sourwood tree because the sheep barreled it over, which is my fault. My my trees are now fenced. So <laughs> learned my lesson on that too. Well, if you need any pecan trees, I've got a billion of them that are small popping up all over the place. If you want a free one to try somewhere else or multiple free ones to try somewhere else because they're going to get cut down anyway. So with fruit trees, like I mentioned at the beginning of this episode, we obviously have been here for a year and a half and we just planted our first fruit trees. And I'm really glad that we did because it took three-ish months before we saw any sort of water down there. And now that the whole orchard is mowed nicely, we can see actually how much water flows through there. And it is a ridiculous amount. So if we had just tried to, I mean, we couldn't have even planted them down there before because it wasn't cleared out to do so. But if we had, and we didn't know that it was going to get that flooded, we probably would have planted them in the wrong spots. So, and I'm still not 100% sure we put them in a good spot. So it's still a gamble. 2022, October, Michaela really wanted to plant fruit trees right away. And I'm glad that I made her wait. The next one on my list is sign up for Chip Drop. It'll solve all of your needs. A moment of silence for that. <laughs> I've been signed up for Chip Drop in any way possible. The logs, the mulch, both since we arrived, actually before we even had possession of our property. <laughs> I signed up like a month ahead of time and I've never gotten one and it's been over a year and a half now. So it's just not in our area. Luckily, we found some tree guys that are in our area often and they have brought us a couple of loads of mulch at this point. That's been our mulch supply and I'm having to ration it because I'm no longer 
waiting on a chip drop. I'm still renewing it, hopeful, but not too hopeful. Yeah, I've gotten that advice too. And I think unless you're in a really metropolitan residential area, it's probably going to be really hard to get a chip drop. I stayed signed up for it. I even volunteered to pay for a truckload of mulch and absolute crickets. So I've given up on it at this point. I'm I'm not on there, but it works for some. It doesn't work for everybody. Yeah, I've looked at the uh, the map and the deliveries where they do drop offs. Like recently, you can see where recent drop offs have been, and there's maybe like one in the last year within like a half hour of me. So I think to get closer to Charlotte, it gets a lot more popular. But we're an hour from Charlotte, so I don't really have high hopes. Not to say you shouldn't sign up for it and try. It's definitely worth a shot, but just don't have too high of expectations like we did because you might have your little heart broken. Another one on my list is you should just buy the specialized tool for the job. If I bought the specialized tool for the job every single time I had a project, I would be even more broke than I am now. Is it helpful? Yes. Does it work? Yes. But I don't have the money to just throw at things like this. And I do things a little bit less efficiently. And I do things by hand because I (laughs) want to save money. I would would love to just go on a shopping spree at Lowe's and just get all of the tools for all of the things. That would be amazing. Then I would also have to store them. And I have a very small house and I have a very small storage shed. And then everything else is for animals and hay and stuff like that. So... In theory, yes, it's nice, but in practice, it doesn't always make sense. I feel like you need to give us an example of a specialized tool. (laughs) Like, what are you referring to? There's a portion of, at at the back of the pasture, that was forest, and I went through there, and I cut down a bunch of trees, but there's still a bunch of brush, and I'm going through there with, you know, $20 loppers, and cutting things off at the stems, and sending the sheep back there, and wanting them to eat some things back instead of, you know, taking a piece of equipment back there, partially because when I cut the trees, I didn't take the stumps out, which would be another piece of equipment to rip stumps out of the ground. I just cut them as close as I could to the ground and I'm letting the sheep go back there. It would be really hard to get something like a brush hog back there to take care of that vegetation, even if I did want to sink the money into it. So to do things, you know, the way people would tell me to do them or more by the book would be exponentially more expensive. Don't tell Taylor this because he loves to buy specialized tools for things. (laughs) It's his favorite, favorite hobby. If you want to, go for it. But I don't want to. The next one that I have is kind of similar to your first one. And it's to hire goats to clear land for you. In our area, I've looked into this because... I thought it was a really good idea too when I first realized how much kudzu we have. It is like $1,200 an acre here to get that done. And we have two and a half acres of just straight up kudzu. (laughs) That's not, not counting the mixed areas. That's just the kudzu. So that's a little bit out of my budget. I'm sure it's a really great thing to do if you have the money to do it. And I would love to have a happy little herd of goats annihilating my kudzu, but just... Not really in the budget for us. Why don't you just get goats now, Michaela? (laughs) If I'm going to spend like $3,000 to hire goats to come clear my property, I could just buy goats. I mean, yeah, we've just kind of decided like once we do have the money for the goats, we'd rather just invest in our own herd of goats instead of hiring them to come one time because the kudzu is just going to come back. So we'd have to do it multiple times a year. Might be good advice for somebody, but not for me. My next one is people got really confused when I started talking about my mobile setup for the chickens. And they were telling me, you can't keep chickens in a mobile coop. It doesn't work because they get too confused. And I understand where they're coming from because chickens like to go to the same place every night to roost. But I have never had any issues. You know, I move the coop with the chickens and I move the net around them. So they're never confused at night about where to go and roost. I think the only time that it's really become an issue is when I moved their setup like clear across the pasture almost 
as it was time for them to go to bed. There there are cases where I have had to catch them and show them where their coop is, but that's when I've failed to, you know, plan accordingly or when they don't have a clear line of sight to to their coop. And they're used to it at this point. It's doable. You can do it. <laughs> don't listen to the naysayers. Who told you that? Just out of curiosity. Like a cashier at Tractor Supply <laughs> is one of the people that comes to mind. But, I mean, especially with, with these regenerative permaculture practices, whatever you want to call them, that run counter to, you know, I'll call it conventional practices. I think just because people aren't used to hearing it done that way, they're immediately skeptical and then immediately say that's not going to work. I've never heard the point of view that someone would think that wouldn't work. Like, I get it now that you explain it, but I've never heard that sentiment. And it's it's just funny to me to think that people don't realize that it works. I don't know. I guess I've immersed myself into the the mobile coop world <laughs> immediately when I came into homesteading. Right. It's normal to us, but it's not normal to yeah. a lot of people. This next one, I can't really dive into a lot of detail on, but just general home project advice. I, I don't even know what to say. Everybody wants us to do all of the projects yesterday. They want all the projects done. <laughs> That's all I can really say about it. I, I guess I can give a couple examples. We've gotten comments about our foundation issues with the water leaking into the basement. And obviously that's a huge problem. And that's something that we are hoping to deal with as soon as possible. But it's like a very, very, very expensive project where we have to trench around the entire front of our house, remove our porch temporarily, fix all of the, the drainage and whatnot, install tile waterproof the exterior, take out our carport and our laundry room, like the floor, refill it with fill dirt, put our driveway back in, all that stuff. Like it's a huge project. So that's just like a, the main example. But people are like, you need to do that now. It should have already been done. Like, why are you not working on that? Trust me. I know. <laughs> uh, and that's just pretty much with every project. People want to know why our drywall is not finished yet. I don't have an answer. <laughs> Because you and your husband are working and building a homestead and you're doing all these social media projects on the side. We're, we are human at the end of the day and there are only so many hours in the day and we can only do so much. Yeah, I mean, like, we are really super cool humans, but we're still humans. <laughs> the next piece of advice is actually probably a good piece of advice for most people, but it just doesn't work for me which is to go slow. I don't have that setting. I am not a person who can go slow. If I try to go slow because it's the quote unquote right way to do it, then I end up losing interest and then I end up abandoning it. So I cannot do it at all or I can do it full, full tilt and there's really no in between for me personally. I'm the same way. I think that's the reason I like homesteading so much is because I can like, I can go full speed on one thing until I run out of steam on that. And then I can just switch right to something else and keep going full steam on that while my interest is there. And then I can come back to the other thing whenever my interest comes back. Yeah, slow is not really a thing for me. I'm sure that's great advice for someone though. For normal, healthily functioning people. <laughs> I'm sure it's a great piece of advice. My next one is that ducks don't need a pond. <laughs> Worst advice. Give your ducks a pond or a pool or some sort of water. And if you don't know why I'm saying this, please refer to episode one <laughs> and it will tell you all you need to know. It can be very stressful and very expensive if you, if you don't allow that. This one I actually saw a post about today on Instagram. Which is that natural pest control doesn't work and that you have to spray or treat with some sort of chemicals to be effective. And I completely disagree with that. I think there's a difference between planting one marigold and saying that's natural pest control and planting a border of marigolds and herbs and interplanting flowers to attract, you know, beneficial insect predators and planting trap crops. Like 
there's there's a way to do it, but just because you try one thing one time and you still have some pests on your tomatoes, you know, there's levels to it. And also, for me personally, I'm of the philosophy that if, you know, all these bugs and all these pests don't want to eat my food, I kind of don't want to eat it either. <laughs> if it's so unappetizing to them or so lethal to them, I personally don't really care to put that in my body. So I'm always okay with sacrificing a little bit of productivity. I just count on losing some things to bugs because that's just how it goes. Yeah, and I think that on the scale that we grow, it's pretty easy to account for like a little bit extra to know that you're probably going to lose some to bugs or other critters or whatever. I think that natural pest control methods, you just have to kind of be more intentional and more thoughtful about it. So whether whether that's picking things off by hand, it's gonna it's just more hands-on. You need to think about it a little bit more. Um, so it might be more labor intensive, but I I personally think it's worth it. That actually ties really, really well into my next point, and that is If you're not doing it the same way as someone else, then you're doing it wrong. And I personally really love to experiment with things and just really try a bunch of different stuff and see what sticks. So my philosophy is to do it your own damn way (laughs) and, you know, take the advice that people give you, evaluate it. Don't just don't just ignore everything that everyone says evaluate it, decide and weigh if it will or won't work for you or if pieces of it will work for you. Try it out and see. Just make sure you feel good about what you're doing for your homestead, your garden. That can be applied to anything in life, not just homesteading. But yeah, my philosophy is to do it. Do it however works best for you. There are so many ways to do something. And I think the way that we are you know, typically taught in school is this is the right way to do this. And we get that so locked in our heads that we think, okay, there's one way to do this. And if I don't do it that one way, then I'm wrong. And I'm always a fan of, you know, making the mistakes and learning from that. There's also nothing wrong with doing it wrong to some extent. But there's a million and a half ways that a million and a half people can work towards the same goal. I mean, that kind of goes back to the the mobile coop thing you said earlier, where someone's like, they didn't even think that was a possibility because it's just not something that they'd ever experienced before. So I think there's a lot of value in trying something. And whether you fail or not, I think you learn, learn a lot. One that I hear not so much directed at me, but just in general, is... People thinking and people saying that you can't grow or shouldn't grow a garden in non-ideal soil. So if you have really clay-heavy soil, that, oh, that's terrible for a garden. Or if you have really compacted soil, that's terrible. You can't grow anything there. And I disagree with that. For one, I think that plants are a whole lot more resilient than we give them credit for. And two... You can turn almost any soil into pretty decent garden soil with enough time, enough inputs, and enough effort. I know you have incredibly clay-dominant soil, and where I put my garden, I've said it before, I'll say it again, was the absolute worst soil on my entire property. (laughs) And I think it, again, we get caught up in our heads of, oh, this isn't the right way. And there's just so many more factors to that. And I, I, it always breaks my heart when I hear people talk about, oh, well, I can't have a garden because my soil isn't good. I feel like there are so many more aspects to it than just the one, too. Like, it's not just NPK, like, levels. It's not just, I have clay soil. It's going to, like, it depends on where you are. It depends on what's been, like, put on your garden previously. Like, we had some sort of large animal in our garden. So it's compacted and it's clay. But a year later, after having things covered up with mulch and silage tarp, it's the top few inches are nice and fluffy already. So like, I think, you know, over time, it's just going to keep getting better. It's just a matter of putting effort into, uh, not a, not even just effort, effort and time into remediating I guess but not necessarily just like making it better you know better for what you're trying to use it for 
ameliorating. There's some, ameliorating. There's some fancy vocab out there. The last one on the list for the worst advice from both of us is to read this book, which there are so many wonderful resources out there. And it's not necessarily, you know, people recommending books. That's bad advice. It's just if I tried to read all of the books that everyone recommended to me, I wouldn't have time to homestead because there are so many wonderful resources out there. I, there's just no way that I can get through all of them. And I'm also someone who doesn't really like to read. I used to love to read and school kind of ruined it for me. That's a whole other thing. But it's so much easier for me to sit and watch a video on YouTube of someone doing it and explaining it that way than it is for me to sit through an entire book to get you know, the same or similar knowledge. Yeah, I'm definitely more of a video person. I learn a lot better in a medium format, I would say. Not necessarily videos like TikTok that are short and quick. I don't do well with those. Like, I'd have to watch it a million times to actually get the concept of, like, something that's trying to be taught to me. And then a whole book, I don't have the time or the patience to sit down and read. Like, I just don't. And you can say, you know, everybody has the same 24 hours in a day, but I have 24 hours and a really long to-do list. So <laughs> the reading isn't my priority. I do, however, really like audiobooks because I can do other things while I'm like listening to it. And uh, YouTube videos are usually my go-to for things that I need to retain the information and I, I don't know maybe that's just like a I'm a visual learner type of thing I have an easier time picturing things when I'm listening to the audiobooks than I do if I'm reading the words in my own head because I get distracted I mean I think I've mentioned this before but I feel like that might be a like a generational thing we learn best we both learn best with audio or uh, videos the generations behind us probably learn best from books generations after us probably learn best from tiktoks yeah i think to some extent it's probably a generational thing um i think for us specifically it's probably also a, a neurodivergence <laughs> thing i think i think we're not oh, yeah. normal people and that's okay no. um it's all good <laughs> Part of why it, sure. we get along really well but uh <laughs> yeah it's comes with with pros and cons <laughs> All right, are you ready to move on to some positive advice, some best advice? Yes, please. Let's do that. The first one on my best pieces of advice list is to plant blue Hubbard squash as a trap crop. I hadn't heard of this, and I tried it for the first time last year, and it worked so well for me. And that means that the blue Hubbard squash did terrible because... It got, you know, targeted first by the vine borers and the other squash pests, but it gave my other squash plants and especially the things that take a really long time, like pumpkins, it gave them a chance to go to fruit at least a little bit. I still had pest issues. I still lost some produce to those pests, but it was infinitely better than the year previous had been. Did you like mix them in like a plant around... Or like within your other ones? Or did you just do one? Or like have them all in one area? How did you implement that? I had two different... Well, I had three different areas where I planted various winter squashes. The things that take a little bit longer to get a maturity. One of them was just a butternut squash bed. I didn't interplant any blue hubbard in there because butternut squash is supposed to be pretty resistant to begin with. So I didn't worry about those. And then I had two other areas just because they take up so much space. I was just kind of cramming them wherever I could. And I interplanted it in both areas. So I think I had three plants total. Two of them were in the larger bed with the rest of the pumpkins. And then one of them was in the smaller bed with the rest of the pumpkins. I think I'm going to try it again this year. None of ours did really well last year just because the squash bugs killed everything immediately. I also had issues with being able to water our garden last year so they were struggling because of that as well i think that's good advice i've seen other people recommend that too my first one is one that sage said i should do <laughs> actually it's not something she said i should do it's something she said she does or she did and she doesn't regret it yet so we just kind of rolled with that 
<laughs> and we're about to make everybody mad. <laughs> Are you ready? Her advice was plant mint. That might not sound malicious, <laughs> but mint spreads like crazy. And the way she told me that she did it was she just pops it in as a companion plant with her other annual plants. And I was like, okay, that makes sense because it smells really strong. So it probably helps to keep bugs away. But how do you get it from spreading around in your garden? And she's like, well, I don't know yet. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know if I'm going to regret it. I kind of took that and I was like, all right, if I'm going to be pulling weeds out of my garden anyway, I might as well be pulling mint out of my garden because the mint will crowd out the other stuff. You know, if I'm going to have a weed, it might as well be useful. I think advice might be a strong word for that. <laughs> I was like, this is probably a terrible idea, but I'm going to do it anyway. Definitely a do as I say, not as I do situation. Mint is the only thing that I can companion plant to keep the flea beetles at bay. And it doesn't even, you know, work 100%. It just works well enough that I can keep my eggplants alive and get some sort of produce off of them. And, you know, in theory, if you harvest it really, really heavily, it won't completely take over, but it does spread. It is vicious. It will take over, but I haven't regretted it yet. Yeah. What I might try doing to do like a trial year for this is putting clay, like putting pots in the ground with it so that it can't spread the roots but that it's still like in the ground with the plants around it. And so it's, you know, companion planted right next to them. I might try that and see how it works just before I go wild with the mint all over the place. Another great piece of advice that I've gotten is to keep notes. And the notes that I have kept, I have found very valuable. I actually just bought a journal from the store so that I can write down what I'm seeing, when I'm seeing it, and so that I can refer to that in future years. I know that a handwritten notebook isn't the most efficient way. I know that I could put it in some sort of electronic document and then I could search it. But if if I did it that way, I wouldn't do it. So a handwritten notebook that I have to flip through and and maneuver manually is better than nothing. I tend to take notes with my phone just because I always have it out there with me, like when I'm doing things in the garden. So I take photos, you know, I take so many pictures every day because I'm trying to take photos to post as content, but it also just really helps me document where the property and flowers are at and the garden too, once it's actually in season. And so I've actually been using that to kind of gauge when to plant things this year based off of last year's pictures for like when I planted things, if I liked when I planted them last year and when like what the weather was doing. And this year we're a little bit more behind than we were last year. That's what works for me. I also do a lot of the digital stuff, but then I print it out and put it in. I have like a homestead binder that I'm trying mm -hmm. to keep track of things. It's I'm not the best at it yet, but I'm trying. One of the things that I use probably most often is just my phone camera roll. I'll go back to, okay, this time last year, what did it look like? Okay, this time, 2022, what did it look like? That's incredibly helpful for me, but also I'm like almost out of storage on my phone. So I need to find a way <laughs> to move those photos. But I will also keep notes in my seed starting file. So I, I have different sorts of notes that I keep different places. And I kind of like that too, because, you know, maybe if I forget, one way then I'll have a note to myself in in a different way or something that I can go back and reference so there's a lot of different ways you can do it but any way that you can manage to do it I I promise it will be helpful yeah that's another good recommendation of doing what works best for you because everyone's gonna have a different method that works best for them with note note taking my next one is one that I just got told a couple months ago, and this is from an Instagram friend that is, she's about halfway between Sage and I location-wise, and she grows lots and lots of poppies every year. The way she finds the most success with them direct sown is to sow them in late January on a rainy day. And I don't know if that's going to work for everybody everywhere, but Western North Carolina, if you're in this area, it's working well. We have a lot of them sprouting 
outside right now. So I'm excited to see if they actually turn into something. Hobbies are something that I still haven't direct sown because I'm I'm me and I have my weird things. I just tend to transplant everything. So even with poppies, I will start those inside and transplant them, even though they, they're they supposed to hate it. Maybe I'll give that a try. I have always been really nervous to grow the poppies and we keep moving. So in the past, I've never been able to actually do it. But because they need light to germinate, I'm always like, okay, it's got to be just like the perfect situation. And I just raked up the front garden bed in front of our house since everything's going to get torn out anyway. I'm not trying to plant anything perennial in there yet. And I just raked it up, sprinkled them all over the place, and I watered them, and we've been getting rain, like, every few days. So they're all, you know, this tall now. I planted them a little later than she said because I just wasn't quite ready to do it at that point, but we'll see. Another one that I found incredibly helpful is, and I didn't really follow it, but get to know your property for a year before you make big plans. Kind of like what I talked about with the fruit trees earlier, it would have been beneficial for me to wait on that particular item. I wasn't going to have this property that I wanted to homestead and do absolutely nothing for a year so that I could wait and watch for everything. But anything that I did do in the first year, I was emotionally prepared to have to, you know, undo or redo or adjust in some fashion if you know I got through that first year and realized something about the property that I couldn't realize without having that sort of context that comes with time and so you know going back to the fruit trees if I had been able to watch my property for a little bit longer and been able to observe it through all four seasons I would have noticed some things that would have made me hesitate to put the trees that I did lose where I put them the observe your property for a year or X amount of time and planting fruit trees right away are the two most popular like new homesteader or permaculture advice. And I definitely agree that observing your property is the more important one. They kind of contradict each other because why would you plant the most permanent thing right away without observing first? The next one on my list is just start. And I know that a lot of people don't have access to be able to buy their own land right away. So I don't mean just start in that sense, but I mean, start learning how to preserve food from grocery store food or salvage store food like I like to do. Invest in small things as you're able to before you are able to buy a homestead because it's just going to be a rush of costs all at once once you do get it. So if you can get things a little bits at a time beforehand, that's actually going to be very helpful. Canners, any sort of kitchen supplies, like dehydrating supplies, vacuum sealers, things like that. Uh, Beekeeping, gardening courses, seed starting supplies, anything that you can manage to store in your current space and utilize right now, I would suggest just trying it and getting acquainted with the, the processes and the equipment And you're going to be a lot better off once you actually do get to the point of having property, if you do get to that point. Yeah, I think, and I fell victim to this before I had a homestead property, but I think a lot of us feel like, well, you know, I'm not a homesteader yet. I don't have my property yet. I'm not there yet. I can't do these things. And I think that's a really good piece of advice. It, it does get tricky if you're like moving across the country to do that because it also means that you have to move all that equipment. But for example, if I didn't have all the random kitchen tools that I have accrued over the last decade or more, I, I would have ended up spending a lot more money. But I think I think that's the only area that I was really able to do that. And that wasn't even necessarily intentional. But I am grateful for it now that I'm here. Even just learning the skills without purchasing your own equipment. Like I said, taking a gardening course or a beekeeping course. So you're familiar with like how things work or finding friends in your current location or whatever that are doing those things and asking if you can help and have them teach you. One of the big things that I did was 
I was like, all right, if I'm going to raise chickens, I need to figure out what on earth to do with a whole chicken because I was so used to just going to the grocery store every week and buying a packet of chicken breast and being done with it. And I was like, okay. And I know how to cook these things right, but to be able to design a week's worth of food around all of the different kinds of meat because I like to cook my dark meat a little bit different than I would my chicken breast. Like they're, they're different meals and having to incorporate that thought process into that preparation so that nothing is wasted or as little as possible is wasted is, is a different way of thinking than if you're just going to the grocery store versus growing your own food. Stuff like that, like learning how to can doing exactly what you just said, that, that kind of stuff is, why I say when I decided I was going to do homesteading, I was like, I'm a homesteader immediately because embracing that allowed me to just go for it and like learn all of that stuff right away. And it gave me the the energy to do it because I was excited about being a homesteader, even though I was living in my friend's spare bedroom. My next couple are very much in the same vein. It's, you know, doing what you can with what you have, where you are, which is exactly what we just talked about. And also perfect being the enemy of good enough. Especially for those of us who are prone to perfectionism, we feel like if we can't do it perfectly, if we aren't perfectly prepared, that we we shouldn't start yet. There's still more preparation to do. And there's a fine line between not preparing enough and preparing so much that you're putting off actually doing the thing. <laughs> Homesteading is something that really humbled me when it came to that. Like, all right, I just need to get over this. It's not going to be perfect. It's going to be messy. <laughs> I'm going to make mistakes. But it's it's do it imperfectly or don't do it. And given those choices, I'd rather do it imperfectly. This is like the first thing I've ever done that I've been like, it's cool if I don't do it perfectly. And I think that's why I really like it so much because I am such a perfectionist with things. So this, I'm like really, really embracing the, if I mess it up or if it, it doesn't work out how I planned, then I still learn something. That's just... <laughs> what I've been trying to live by and this is like the first thing in my entire life that I've ever done that I'm like I am not bored of this yet because I didn't just like achieve it you know like I didn't just it's not just one checkbox it's seven million checkboxes I can never achieve it <laughs> it's always going to be a learning process <laughs> I can never do it yeah. perfectly because yeah. there's not one way to do it perfectly this is more of a advice from other fellow homesteading youtubers that Filming your progress is a super valuable tool. And we already kind of talked about taking notes. But even if you film something and you never share it with anybody, I personally think that filming what you're doing and your progress that you're making, and the key to it is making sure you actually look back on it, is a huge tool for growth and just it's like a really good pat on the back reward for yourself you know a year down the line it's like a little present that you're giving to yourself because you can see how far you've come and for me the way that I look back on things I love to look at old, like previous year's pictures but making time lapse or year in review style videos is like it's so fun for me to do because I get excited about how much we've done and how far we've come with things and how different everything looks. And it just gets me like energized for the next year. So even if you're not posting things socially or like to social media, I think filming yourself or just taking pictures, as many pictures as possible. So you can see the difference in things a year from now is, is a really good idea. I know that I always really appreciate taking photos because when you see your property every day, you don't realize how much it's changing, even over the course of a week, right? Mm -hmm. And especially at the beginning of garden season. And so to be able to look back at the photos and compare what's in front of you right now with what it looked like a few days ago or a few weeks ago, that always is really encouraging to me because I'm like, oh, okay, wow, it has changed this much. It just makes you feel good. And sort of back to the topic of potentially bad advice, one of the best pieces of advice that I got was to sometimes not take advice, to not take advice from people whose life you don't want 
because if you're taking advice from them, it's going to get you where they've gotten themselves, right? And there are unlimited ways that you can choose to live your life, but taking advice from someone that you don't agree with or you don't want, you know, how they're living is not going to get you to where you want to be. This is the point where everybody who doesn't want the exact farm setup and whatnot that we have regrets the last hour of their life. <laughs> no, I think that's good advice. Obviously, like you could you could take that a bunch of different ways, but I think it just kind of goes back to doing what's best for you and what's in your best interest and what works for your goals. The next one that I have is a hard one for me. <laughs> And that is asking for help. I hate asking for help. I've gotten better about it with Taylor, but I'm also just so stubborn. Like, I can do things by myself and I don't want to rely on him to do things for me because, like, he's busy too. Some things I'm like, okay, yes, just ask because it will be easier and less stressful for everyone. (laughs) If you just say, hey, can you help me with this? I also really struggle with that. Partially because... You know, one of the reasons that I'm going through all this effort to grow my food is because I can be incredibly picky. Like, I, I know what I want and I know what I don't want. And there are so many layers to everything in my own head that even if I were to ask for help, it's really difficult for me to explain all of the contingencies to somebody or, you know, it's it's one thing if I were to ask my friend who gardens to help me transplant the rest of my transplants because there's already so many layers of things that she already knows that I don't have to explain to her versus if I were to ask, you know, a random friend or a random neighbor who doesn't garden, I would have to be like, well, yes, but you actually have to do this and this and this and this and this and like, oh, actually that's wrong because then then I just feel terrible. Then I feel like like I'm being mean and I would have rather just done it by myself and stuff. Yeah. Like babysitting is almost as much work as just doing it by yourself. So I get that. I have that same problem. We're just particular. We know what we want. When you needed help doing the raised beds, like Taylor can whip those out and like 10 minutes each and then for us it would have taken a while so certain scenarios it makes sense (laughs) absolutely i will ask for help from someone who is better than me at a task all day long zero (laughs) pride issues there yeah (laughs) taylor is now and will always be better with tools and construction than i am and i'm perfectly okay with that the last one that i have on this list is kind of a random one again like the poppies was (laughs) plant onions in the fall down south. I don't know about you, but this is not something that like ever even crossed my mind to plant my onions or start my onion seeds, anything like that. Like when I'm planting garlic, I'm like, no, onions start in January. (laughs) But locals here have told me to plant onion sets or start my seeds in the fall. And so I tried it with some of our onion sets and they're literally like over a foot tall. They're insane. They're flopped over like really big onions already. And I'm like, okay, is this going to work? Because that would be lovely if I don't have to think about this again next year. I just, or this fall, just put them in the ground. Yeah, that's something I've never tried before and never really heard of before. Granted, most of my gardening time has been in Colorado. It has not been in the South, even though I grew up in the South. And I'm really curious how that works out for you this year. I'm also curious what zone would be the cutoff for, you know, the South, because I'm assuming that works in the South because it's warmer down here versus other places. And, you know, what's what's the trigger point for them not making it through the winter? So I think it's less to do with the zone and the temperatures than it is with the light hours. I think that for short day Mm. onions, like they're referring to the South as like short day onions. So if you think about garlic, I mean, garlic needs like chill hours, right? But I think with the onions, the way that it was explained to me, getting them in the ground gets them established and dormant or whatever for the fall. Like it will get their roots established. Then they'll go dormant over winter, but it gets their light hours and like gets them growing early enough in the season that they can get nice and big before you know before those hours get to whatever point that they're like okay time to start bulbing so I don't know 
I, I don't really have a lot of information on it other than what a few local people have told me. I did it with some sets. I'm going to try it with seeds this fall and I might try it to like do some other experiments with it too. So yeah, that was advice I've gotten in the last year since living here. And obviously I was in Michigan beforehand, so I, that's not something I'd ever heard of, but I think it's definitely solid advice and worth a shot. From our listeners, here are <laughs> their pieces of advice that they said were some of the worst they've gotten. Our Midwestern Roots said, geese are nice because ours were demons. I had a few people reply to that because I shared it on the story and they said it's very breed dependent. So I'm not trying, we're not trying to say all geese are demons. <laughs> <laughs> Our friend Red has a lot of geese, and she said they're all angels. So I think it depends on the individual goose and also their breed, but that's really funny. The second one on Cure is that it's okay to use neem oil on your garden if you're trying to do things organically and just in the most natural way possible. And that is from our friend Red, who was on our first couple episodes here. I mean, it is technically organic, but I think you just don't know what it's going to affect. So I think if you do use it, there are very specific times that you want to apply it. I have done some research on neem oil because I originally used it in my garden and there's a reason I stopped. You don't want to apply it when, you know, in the morning right before your plants are going to get really warm and really direct sunlight because it's kind of like pouring baby oil all over yourself and then standing in the sun all day. Like you're going to get sunburned and that's what happens to your plants. But also... You know, neem oil is often touted as this organic pest control that's not going to harm beneficial insects. And that's not true. Even if you are super careful about when you apply it, it's still going to affect them. It basically affects their uh, reproduction cycle. And so it doesn't kill the actual, you know, current insect that's coming into contact with it. It just changes its behavior it acts like a hormone disruptor and keeps them from doing things they normally would. And so it, it essentially inhibits them reproducing and creating any more of those insects. So it still affects pollinators. It still affects all of the lovely things that you do want to keep in your garden, like ladybugs that eat aphids and um, all of your bees and pollinators and things. So yeah, I that's why I stopped using it. Interesting. I have it because I use it on my indoor plants occasionally. Not that any of my indoor plants are alive anymore, but I used to use it on my <laughs> indoor plants uh, whenever they'd get uh, like soil gnats and whatnot. But uh, I've never really used it on the garden. And I guess I never will. The next one is from Peas Be With You, which love the username. She said, you can't grow that out here because I've never heard of someone doing it. And she was specifically referring to artichokes. Artichokes can be tricky because they're usually perennial and they don't come back if you live somewhere that's too cold. So I'm assuming that's what she was referring to. That's why I don't give too much credit to growing zones because there's so many differences with microclimates, even on one property, that I'm like, none of it matters. <laughs> I actually, speaking of that, I really want to get temperate, uh, like thermometers, like outdoor thermometers and put them on like a tree up at the top of our driveway or like at the top of the garden and then a tree down in the orchard area because the temperature shift all around our property and like the microclimates, the pockets where all of our berms and swales dip down, I swear it's like a 10 degree difference. It's insane like how cold you. you get when you're walking around. Do you do you have that same sort of effect on your property? Yeah, the garden know. is the warmest spot on my entire property and that was intentional and then down by the house <laughs> it gets cool and then specifically because the whole thing is a mountain and there's certain spots that don't get sun until, you know, mid to late morning, like right in front of the hay barn will be the first spot to frost in the fall and when the last to like thaw and not frost again in the spring. Yeah, microclimates are pretty neat. The next one is from Making Doing Mending and she said that I needed a partner to do it. Speaking from experience, you don't need a partner to do it. In some in some ways it's actually easier. 
I'm gonna go ahead and say I would have a significantly more stressful time <laughs> if I didn't have Taylor here to help me. So I would probably not be I, I mean, I couldn't have bought this house to like renovate if I didn't have Taylor because I just don't have the skills to do this. So it would be a completely different situation. I do still think I could do it. It would just have to be very different than it is now. And honestly, like we get along very well. Like he's my best friend. So we don't really have arguments about things usually. Like we're usually pretty much on the same page, but I would still be doing this if I was by myself, I think. Just not here in this catastrophe of a home <laughs> next on the list is mrs squivy i'm sorry if i said your name wrong that tomatoes are easy to grow <laughs> they're really popular they're a really popular garden plant and i think same as anything else once you get the hang of it once you've messed it up a few times because i'm certainly one of those people then it starts to make sense but yeah just because it's a popular garden plant doesn't mean that it's gonna be easy to grow especially the first time around it's popular with a lot of bugs it's popular with a lot of uh blight it's popular with all sorts of things <laughs> i mean it's definitely worth trying to grow and like getting used to growing it but for a beginner plant there are a lot of things that can go wrong with it even just the intricacies of blossom end rot can make your head hurt, right? It's It can be tricky. All right. The next one is from Dos Flores Gardening. And she said, ducks will lay more than chickens. Mine haven't laid since October. I have no clue what ducks are supposed to lay. Our ducks are supposed to lay 300 eggs a year. And they're still not a year old yet. So I don't know what next winter is going to look like for us. I don't know if they'll do a pause, but they're Indian runner ducks. So from what I've seen, they've only taken one or two breaks so far. And they're like, they all stop laying for like a day or two at the same time. And then they all pick right back up. So I don't know how that's going to work in their later years, but as of right now, We've gotten an egg almost every single day from them since they started laying. And you don't have ducks, so. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, I know absolutely nothing. <laughs> from from the stories that I hear from you, you know, it really doesn't convince me to get them. So I'm just going to continue to let you know all the duck things, and I'm going to stay out of it. They are absolutely the best creatures. I love them so much, but they cause me so much stress at the same time. So <laughs> they are my puppy. And the last piece of worst advice that we have on our list from listeners is from A Pig and a Chick, which is that trimming onions before harvest and growing sweet potatoes yams in Michigan. I have heard people say to trim onions before harvest so that it makes the plant send more energy to the bulb and, you know, makes it grow a little bit bigger before you actually pull it. But I haven't really ever noticed a difference i always just pull them once the, you know the neck breaks and the grains flop over and i call that good i have heard that but yeah i i don't do it because i don't feel like it's worth it i've never heard that advice the only advice <laughs> i've ever heard for getting that to happen is to actually step on your onions to bend their necks over so that signals to them that they need to like finish their bulbing process i've never heard the trimming <laughs> interesting i don't know I'm sure there's infinite variations of everywhere in between on that too. Uh, but as far as the sweet potatoes and yams go, yeah, I can see how growing that in Michigan would be a challenge because I have hard enough time having a long enough season here. They are tropical plants. They do not like warmth. That is one that I will wait even after my last frost to plant out because they really genuinely need to be babied with the warmth so good luck to you if you choose to continue to doing that in the north yeah i mean i don't know where specifically they are but where like back home in michigan i've never i've never grown sweet potatoes but back home we wouldn't hit 70s until almost july and then it would be frosting on september mornings so that gives you an example of how long the seasons are there we were in a particularly cold location <laughs> But a lot of Michigan is like that. So I can definitely see why you'd have 
trouble growing those there unless you had like a greenhouse to put them in almost. I feel like you'd have to grow them in some sort of protection that stays warm. Those are the worst pieces of advice that our listeners had received and they sent in to us. But now we're going to go over a few of the best ones. And the first one is from our friend Red again. And she said, wait and watch your land for where to put things like seasons, light, weather, etc. Which that's a point we already touched on. I think that's great advice. And above anything else, when you get to your property or wherever you're trying to grow things, that is very important. Yeah. Hard, hard advice to take. Hard to be patient enough to take that advice, but very valuable information. ZB Farms said, take it one step at a time, slow and steady. Don't try and do it all from the start. Which I absolutely agree that this is wonderful advice for those of you who are, you know, not unhinged. For those of you who are normal and balanced people. Yes, absolutely. I would be entirely unable to take this piece of advice, though. <laughs> yeah, for anyone who's uh, able to actually be patient and take it one step at a time, good for you. You do that. <laughs> Function <laughs> within that moderation. Then the last one that we got on here is from a pig and a chick again, and she said, test your soil, which I have not yet done. I haven't either. You can go off of vibes. <laughs> I can. <laughs> part of part of my degree and what I studied in college was soil science through like the forestry department. It's very legit. And I even went so far as to do like soil judging competitions while I was in college, especially in the southeast. I know my soil. And so I can kind of I can kind of dig a hole in my pasture and gain a lot of information just off of you know texturing the soil and looking at it and for example where I planted one of those pecan trees that died I dug that hole and it was very very clay heavy and I was like oh this is gonna be too acidic but I was already there and I did it and I said oops (laughs) tree did not make it now I know how to fix it I know to add wood ash to it I know to add fertilizer to it I know that it would probably be great for me to steal the leaf mold from the forest and put it right next to that tree so that it seeds it with all those you know beneficial symbiotic relationships with fungus and all those kind of things that we can't see yeah i i have a little bit of an unfair advantage there (laughs) i need to hire you to come to my house and tell me what to do (laughs) (laughs) then i'm responsible if it goes wrong (laughs) no it's already all like wrong so (laughs) it's fine I won't know the difference yeah I've been meaning to do soil tests in a multitude of areas like I want to do one down in the orchard where everything pools and runs down because I'm like the soil down there you can tell it's a lot more like organic matter it's a lot nicer soil than just the straight up clay that's up in the garden so I want to do a couple in the garden. I want to do some down in the orchard. We want to do some over probably in the kudzu area, just out of curiosity. Uh, Cause there's a lot of stuff built up over there too. I need to just do it. I think it's NC state that does it. And then Clemson is also like, if you're near us, but in South Carolina, Clemson would be where you send those in. If you want to get them done at the extensions. Yeah, contact your local extension office and they will have all the information to tell you how to get that processed. Every single state in the U.S. is going to have a, a different university that they send it to. And so it's it's different state by state, but your local extension office will have that information for you. And that's broken down by county, I believe, or at least it's how it's done in Georgia. With that, why don't you guys let us know in the comments below your best and worst advice you've ever gotten for homesteading. Thanks for joining us on this episode of She Said Homestead. We hope you enjoyed our chat. Before we say goodbye, we'd love to hear from you. Send your homesteading stories to us at shesaidhomestead at gmail.com. We can't wait to share them on the air. To stay connected, follow us on Instagram for updates and sneak peeks at what's coming up next. If you like video podcasts, make sure you subscribe to the She Said Homestead YouTube channel too. We can't thank you enough for being part of the She Said Homestead community. Until next time, happy homesteading.